Thanks for tuning in to the Drive On Podcast, where we are focused on giving hope and strength to the entire military community. Whether you're a veteran, active duty, guard, reserve, or a family member, this podcast will share inspirational stories and resources that are useful to you. I'm your host, Scott Delucio, and now let's get on with the show. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Drive On Podcast. Today, my guest is Lieutenant Colonel Brian Slade. He is an Apache pilot and the author of Cleared Hot, Lessons Learned About Life, Love, and Leadership While Flying the Apache Gunship in Afghanistan, and Why I Believe a Prepared Mind Can Help Minimize PTSD. We're going to be discussing his time flying over Afghanistan in Apaches and the challenges that he faced afterwards throughout all of his experiences. So welcome to the show, Brian. Glad to have you here. Well, thanks. I am glad to be here. Appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. So why don't you give us a little bit more background on yourself and, you know, thing, things like that? Okay. Well, you said I'd fly Apaches. I have to correct you a little. I did fly Apaches. I now fly. I transitioned over to the Air Force from the Army, the deployment that the book clear taught that we're talking about. After that deployment ended, I transferred over to the Air Force. Yeah. And I always say I transferred over from, to the Air Force for all the reasons I didn't join it in the first place. <laughs> so like when I was young, you know, I was like, oh, the Air Force, you know, they stand for star hotels, those wusses, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then later I was like, whoa, they stand for star hotels. <laughs> so, I, you know, I made, they're, they're gone for four months at a time instead of 23 months at a time. You know, I made that transition, but then I ended up flying combat search and rescue with the Air Force, which is a whole other, and that's what I currently do. Is what I currently do. I'm the oldest of eight kids. I like to say eldest because it sounds more sophisticated, but there's not a lot that's sophisticated about me. So, so it's kind of misleading. I moved out of my house at 15 because there was no food left. I'm just kidding. That's not why I moved out, but I did move out, finished up high school and I went to college at Utah State. Actually, I went to on a church mission for two years to Brazil. And then I went to college at Utah State, played a little football there. Got in the ROTC, got commissioned, and decided to fly helicopters. And then, you know, that's the catalyst right there. Well, that it seems like you had a pretty interesting upbringing, you know, leaving home at 15 and then, you know, just kind of going on your own way that way. That That is pretty interesting in and of itself. But then let's, you know, you fast forward a few years and you're in Afghanistan and you're flying Apache gunships and you're, you're doing all sorts of crazy stuff over there. And we're, I'm, we're going to get into that for sure. But, um, you know, definitely seems like a, a pretty interesting life up until this point. So uh, I think you can probably kick your feet up and relax for a little bit now uh, <laughs> going on here. But uh, so in the subtitle of your book, I mentioned it earlier, you said that you believe that a prepared mind can help minimize PTSD. Could you walk us through what you mean there, how that, how we might be able to prepare our minds in the context that you're talking about there. I he certainly tried. So that really was the catalyst for me deciding to write the book. I never had any aspirations to be an author or anything like that, but I did start noticing, you know, I had a lot of real world experiences that were pretty intense and came out of them actually what I would consider strong, not unscarred, but stronger. And that I didn't know why at the time, and maybe I still don't fully know why, but we did drill that down and identify some things that we believe were causal in experiencing growth rather than damage from traumatic experiences. And so unbeknownst to me, I mean, I was preparing myself. I was doing certain things to, to prepare in other ways, but I was also preparing myself mentally to minimize the impacts on as it came. And so that's where it really, really uh, started to tell me, it made me feel like I needed to get these type of things out. It's not that they're not out there, but the more you put them out there in different ways, the more people we're going to reach. And so like, I'm not going to share anything cosmic with anybody, but I might open a, a lock in somebody. And that was my intent is, and I tell people like, you know, share your story. You never know home. Your story is going to be the key to someone else's life. I've heard things in different ways and some things resonate and some things don't. But yeah. So to say, you know, there were several principles that there were seven principles that were really outlined in the book. And just to be clear, the book is not super dynamic. I was sneaking at the whole lessons in there. Like it's a, if you want to read it just to have a war story, you're going to be fine. You're not going to be like, ah, oh, this is a teaching instruction. It's not. There's lessons weaved in throughout the both with leadership and how to make yourself more resilient, all that kind of stuff. And then we do kind of do a little bit of a encapsulation at the very end. It's not even a chapter. It's 
really calls. But yeah, it breaks down those seven principles. But one of the principles that I like to start with people, because it, to me, it was kind of commonplace, but what really, when I drilled it down, it helped me realize that I was doing this for this reason, but I had these other effects that actually made me prepared to not have, you know, the damage. And this technique is called chair flying, right? And it's something that most pots will know what that is. It's just us trying to walk through bad scenarios or even not even bad scenarios. It'd just be any scenario that you're not smooth with yet. And you walk through it until you feel comfortable with it because we're limited in how many times we're allowed to practice things in the brain or whatever. So it's a way to go through the mental gymnastics multiple times when you may only get three times to practice it right? Right? or two times or whatever. Well, I kind of took that practice and started to apply it in a lot more in-depth way. I really, I, for me, chair flying is meditation, visualization, and a role play all kind of mixed into one. And so I would start to do breathing exercises to get my mind right. And I was thrown into the deep end a little bit. I was an aircraft commander probably before I was ready. And that, that upgrade happened when we were in the midst of a war. So I was going from being the guy that's not really in charge of the aircraft to the guy that is in charge of the aircraft. And my very first flight as an aircraft commander was pretty hairy engagement. I mean, it was like the learning curve was really steep. And so I was like, okay, I need to do something. I need something to prepare myself because I am a low man on the tone floor as far as experience goes. So I need to gain experience fast in as many ways as possible. And the meditation visualization I opens to flying is what I opted for. So what I would do is I would take emergency procedures. I would take combat scenarios and say, okay, in this scenario, I lose my tail and I'm over bad guy. What am I going to do? Right? And so I would break it down into the very, my first thing I'm going to do is take a deep breath. But that's not going to take too, I can't do that too long because you don't take all the time you need. You got half a second, right? So that's kind of the idea is like, get my wits about me, stay calm, you know, walk through the mental aspect of it as well as then the physical aspect of it. Well, like to go forward on the site, I'm going to look for a flat area. I'm not going to communicate anything. I'm not going to worry about that right now because that's not the priority. Once I get to that priority, we'll execute that. And then I would just walk it all the way through until it was smooth from start to finish. And then I would throw in contingents. Then I would throw in variables. Then I would throw in this happens. And then that happens. I was doing this to prepare myself for the actual physical arena. What I didn't realize is I was also preparing for um, what they call it stress inoculation. And it's not unlike medical inoculation. If you give yourself a weakened dose of the virus or whatever it is, your body builds up an immunity to it. So when a real thing comes, it doesn't grow. You may still get a sniffle. It may affect you a little bit. But it's not going to hurt you like it would without inoculation. Well, I was doing that with mental visualization. I was giving myself those traumatic experiences in a controlled environment that was allowing me to control it, allowing me to be safe, but at the same time experience it, when it actually did come, it didn't affect me as negative. It was, I was already prepared. I'd already seen, I'd already seen blowing up people a hundred times in my head before I actually did it, you know, or I'd already seen my co-pilot getting hit before he got hit and then he got hit, you know, so I already walked through what I would do when that happened. I've already seen like losing all the electrical power and it's, it's dark outside and I have nothing actually black. How do I keep the helicopter stable and communicate when I have no way to communicate? I'd already done that and then it really happened, right? So when those things really happened, they ended up being cool stories instead of the first person to the scene of a crash. That's the first thing. That's what I was doing it for. And the second thing is I didn't go to the scene of my own crash. I didn't go to my scene of my own crash emotionally because my, was, my mind was prepared for that traumatic event and it actually became a stepping stone rather than a tripping stone. So that's one of the techniques that we're talking about. You know, and like that technique, it, and it's something that I don't even think we realize that we do this, but I know with my, my kids, they all play baseball or softball. My daughter plays softball. And whenever they go out on the field, we tell them, Okay, no matter what position you're playing, it doesn't matter where you are, if you're your pitcher, your catcher, your first base, outfield, what it doesn't matter. If the ball comes to you, what are you gonna do? Every single pitch, you gotta think to yourself, what are you gonna do? So that way when the ball is coming to you and you catch it, 
you're not standing there like a deer in the headlights like mm -hmm. okay where am i supposed to throw the ball now yeah you've already kind of went through the whole play in your head okay the ball comes to me i'm gonna pick it up and i'm gonna throw it a first base boom mm -hmm. done you don't even have to think about it it's just that's just the thing that you're going to do and mm -hmm. i think that type of thing might be you know relatable to the type of people who maybe haven't served in a you know a combat operation area you know like like you have where you're flying over these you know dangerous areas you're, you're in danger readily and they may not necessarily relate that but it's the same idea really i think to sports like any sport really where you got to think to yourself okay what am i going to do next what's that next step and you know, even driving on the highway you know what am i going to do if you know that jackass over there decides to cut me off like okay you have to kind of have a game plan in place and so that way you're not wrapping your car around a telephone pole you're able to safely kind of navigate around that situation so you know it, i like how you put that and it just kind of reminded me of how important it is to teach people th these particular skills not just for you know sports the way we might do with our kids but that it's useful to apply later on in life or actually at any stage in life really 100 percent. i mean and you get the nail on the head i mean athletes do this all the time they visualize they go through the things over and over again. When they say the game slowed down, but people didn't slow down. They just rewired those worms, right? So the worms already got it. it the decisions have been made ahead of time. They got, you, you've seen this in professional athletes where the guy's already moving to where it's happening or it happens. And it's literally, he's wired that so, so tight that he can, you can almost sense it's happening before it happens. And you're correct in the fact that you can apply it in your life. Simple as like, I got a difficult decision. A difficult discussion with my boss or my wife, or sometimes not the same person. So, you know, like, how's that going to go? You know, like, she's going to do this. And I normally might get upset and yell. Now, okay, I'm not going to do that, right? I'm going to, I'm going to take a deep breath. I'm going to let, let her get it all out. Get it and go for it. And then I'm going to, I'm going to try to do something to de escalate that. What would that be? And I'll walk through that and actually say the words out loud. And my son makes fun of me. I have a 10 year old. And uh, they constantly like, yeah, you're talking to yourself in the air. I was like, yeah, sort of. I got, I'm talking to someone else. They just don't know it yet. You know, it's, it, it works in all kinds of things. Cool. Sure. So you said there are seven steps. I know we, we just got through the first one here, but could you kind of go through some of the other steps that you have there? Yeah. So uh, one that I think, given what you were saying about your audience earlier, that might be helpful is we talk about building, you know, this isn't cosmic. Like I said, none of this stuff is cosmic. We kind of talk about the end. It, it really a, a positive perspective, right? And maintaining, more importantly, maintaining that positive perspective as a way of life, not just something that you're forcing, right? So like anything, it's about creating habits and it's about creating something that is your default and that's in a positive way. Yeah, I usually tell, this is the story I tell to kind of help paint that picture. And I've told it on a few podcasts already, but basically when I went into Afghan State, I was up to two hundred, and it was my first I've been there several, I've been deployed several times now, but at the, 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 this book is my first deployment. And so I didn't know what to expect. I expected Afghanistan would be nasty because, you know, it's more, so it's going to suck. Right? So we're in a C-17 co-located with three of our Apaches. It's me and two other NCOs. I'm the lieutenant, they're the NCOs, and we're, I'm the advanced, we're the advanced part of the arc, right? We're going to start set up and basically say, oh, so, so we're the, literally the first guys from our organization that are going to be boots on the ground and and air base. So we're descended in there and we're all lit. We're at the start inside of the two, you know, the C-17 and it's morning. It's early morning. The sun hasn't come up yet, but it's still, it is light outside. So it's dawn. And my eyes have been definitely accustomed to the dark. And as that clamshell the back starts to open, you know, the C-17, it's like that, you know, that piercing light, even though there's not a sun up that you can't really see we're seeing and i have all this anticipation built up in me because you know ever since 9 11 i was rare so here i am i'm here i'm ready here it comes right and it opens what am i going to see you know it's all this anticipation you know a lot of we have lots of times you know, that's the case we don't know what to expect we got a lot of anticipation built up and as it slowly comes the first thing it hits me is, is it doesn't stink <laughs> you know i like i thought it would smell horrible because it's a bad place now if i've landed in Canavar, what right? but it, it done it didn't right and as it opened up right in front of me i see these majestic that are covered in and i'm from the north west and i'm like 
They start Rocky Mountains. What the heck? It's not supposed to be pretty. Mm-hmm. What's going on? You know, but it was great. Very. And then I had to fly on those mountains and I had got into a really heavy stuff. Yet. And I'm like, man, what's snowmobile over there? That'd be a wicked snowmobile trail there. I mean, this is beautiful. You know, it's that kind of stuff. And you just got, you know, it's hard to appreciate it when you know we're in a war, but at the same time, it's like, it's beautiful. And then we get a call to go out, to, to descend out of the vehicle and to get into the other. And that call is a troops and cars, which means that they're trading bullets and it's not at a bazaar. And like they're trading them at high velocity. And the bad guys have, a, have the upper hand. That's why they call us. And then we're, at, we're going to shift that tide, right? So we got bigger bull. And, you know, the call that you get from a ground guy is one of extreme urgency, one that you can tell that you're the mindset of just seeing what the picturesque views has taken a 180. He's breathing hard. You hear the gunfire in the back and he's saying, I need immediate suppression on the one, two, zero for 300 meters. We are taking effective fire. Roger. That's what we got to do. All right. We're going to roll in. So he's in the gun. He's in the gunfire. And that's all he sees. That's all he sees. That's all that, that's all that matters to him at that moment. And he is not aware of anything other than this. We're now in his goal. For and that's all worth for us. Near the throwing ordinance at the back. I am focused on what we are doing, what we're going to do, how we're going to react, all those kind of things. But in the middle of that chaos, those mountains never changed. Those mountains were still there and they were still beautiful. And they're still snowcat and that wicked snowmobile trail still there. Right. And, but they're not in my head. They're not in my mindset. What's in my mindset right now is the right in front of me. And that's become my world. But that what's in front of me is either this will end, this will pass. We'll get through this. We may have some scores from it, but it's not in a forever event. But those mountains, that beauty, it is. That's forever. You raise up even higher to 30,000 feet where you see the curvature of the earth. And I don't care if you're over the freaking wastelands or wherever, it's still going to be beef. Because you can see the curvature and you see that in every direction. When you raise up to where you can see the globe and yes, I haven't seen this. When you raise out there in space, you're literally looking at a celestial ball. That's what you're looking at. And now the beauty is not in every direction because it is no direction. The beauty just is, right? And that's the forever. That's the reality of what is beauty, right? In that planet, on that planet, the same time that you were experiencing all that beauty, there's a lot of gunfire. There's a lot of gunfire. But those are temporary. Those should be temporary. We should move to make them come and understand that growth comes from those or can come from their potential. And that's where we get into the application of how we keep that in the mind that the beauty is always there. So on the application side of that, okay, we get that. It's beauty. That's it. It's always there. That's the big picture. But application is always the most harder than freaking just, you know, the momentary, like, I get it differently. So I always tell people it's easier to look, it's easier looking backwards and forwards. It's easier to see things when we look in hindsight than look at foresight. And so... Challenge people to look back at your ends, man. Look back at your growth. Look back at what, where you've seen the biggest, you know, some of your biggest changes that are in the positive. And I would guess for you, you know, given your story, one of the toughest things that happened to you has now been also a source of a lot of your strength and love, who you are now. Right? And that's true, Will. Right? We almost always have our biggest wins after a this trial. Sometimes they're self-inflicted trials. Those are called goals. Right? So, I mean, that's where it's purposefully self-inflicted. Some are self-inflicted that aren't goals, and that's a different thing. But when we come through those things on the other side, we're strong. We can be if we utilize it. Right? And that's where our wins come from. So if we know that, then we take our wins side and we play that fork. When we play that forward and then we're in the middle of that company. We're in a company. You know, that's not an obstacle. That's an opportunity because there's something that can come from this that can make us a better version of ourselves. 
And that's just a practice. You know, there's a good book on this by Ben Hari called The yeah, Undertaker. And it's not about war. It's not about, it's just about us. It's about focusing on your game, not your death. What's your focus on what you're gained, not what you're missing or where you're lacking. I'm not where I want to be. Well, where are you compared to where you were yesterday? Right? You know, where's your win between yesterday and today? Where's your win between yesterday and a month ago? Where's your win between yesterday and a year? So it's a great book and it's kind of like this the scholarly version of what I'm trying, my boots and grab boots on the ground version of saying, you know, every obstacle is an opportunity and that becomes a habit by forcing the, that back, that backwards look to go forward. And it, at first it's, at first it's very intentional. At first it has to be very intentional. Okay. You can remind yourself, there's all kinds of different techniques to remind yourself you can do it or whatever. I'll tell you a really good way. If you have a kid, you explain this to him and then you tell him. When I'm not focusing on my wins, you call me out. Kids love to call the parents out. Right? So my kid will be like, are you focusing on your wins? I'm like, no, you got me. Okay, let's focus on the wins. Right. So that's how you, like anything, there is no like magic pill. You're going to have to practice it. But it's just very doable. And, and then it becomes a very rare focus on any kind of negatives or stay there very long because it's become a practice. And my kid is very similar. He's doing the same goals. And I see it in stronger in him to where he doesn't stick at and long, long, he's not focused on when he's focused on long, he's whatever long time. And uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, I think that's one of the biggest takeaways from all of this is that mentorship that you have with your kids and where any parent has with their children is being able to pass something along as valuable as that allows them to deal with the negatives in life because there's going to be negatives i don't care who you are or how much you've prepared yourself for Absolutely. things it doesn't matter there's always going to be something negative that happens to everybody at some mm -hmm. point or not i don't think anyone has gotten out of life unscathed <laughs> you know like we, we yeah. all have something right so how do you deal with that right and when a kid has a role model to look up to someone who has been through some crap in their lives and they still wake up in the morning with a smile on their face and they're still able to see the positives in life instead of you know just being down and depressed and letting life beat them up it's going to give them the tools that they need to be able to succeed in life when they get older you know they're Things just pile up sometimes and want them to be able to deal with these things so that, you know, as a 30, 40, 50 plus year old person, they're able to continue having that positive attitude throughout their lives. Yeah. Well, it's been a, it's been a joy. That's my favorite thing. That's my favorite habit of words. Yeah. It's also very stressed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was that. questioning yourself, um, am I doing it right? Am I, you know, am I doing the best I can? You know, honestly. Yeah, that, I mean, that's one of those things where the, there's no owner's manual to a kid, no. you know, they're, they're well, born not, and your hand, well, there's, and there's there's a lot of them, but, but a lot, and a lot of them have crappy advice. So you got to be careful hey. which, which one you pick, right? You know, but you get to, you get your child and it's like, now I have to figure this stuff out. And, no. you know, if I want to read one of those, you know, quote unquote owner's manuals, you got to figure out which one to actually pay attention to. Right. And, you know, some of them are, some of them are crap, some of them are okay, but you know, you, you can only do the best that you can do no matter what it is that you're doing with them. So, you know, having that positive attitude certainly isn't going to hurt anything. Right. No, not at all. And, uh, honestly, like, uh, <laughs> I think that they're great and not intent. Like I feel like our kids, you know, they can feel it. They can feel the intent. You don't have to be pretty. Yeah. You don't have to get the book down. Right. You don't have to do those kind of things. They just have to know that that's what I feel. You know, I, I guess he's 10, so we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, it seems like he's off to a good start at least. So that that's a good thing. I, I did want to fast forward a little bit, talk about your time in Afghanistan. You talked a little bit about it, but, and may, maybe we can talk about some of these other lessons and we could kind of maybe incorporate it into your time in Afghanistan, but specifically you were awarded the distinguished flying cross for some of the actions in Afghanistan. And I watched the video of the mission that you were on. And I, I gotta admit, it's, it was a pretty intense video to watch. I mean, um, 
you know, not a lot as far as the video goes is in terms of the intensity, but the conversation that was going on, that, that was a pretty intense conversation and, you know, everything that, that happened that day. Can you tell us about the events of that mission and, and what took place and maybe some along the way, some of the lessons that either you talked about in your book or that you learned along the way that uh, kind of helped you out? Yeah. Viewer discretion is advised. Um, so yeah. <laughs> so it's interesting how, how things transpire. It, when I went to Afghanistan, I was, like I said, I was a cold pot, then they became an NC, then I became a company commander, then I became, it, it was just like this boy becomes man thing in a lot of different ways, like not just in, not just in like experience, but also in position, also in responsibility. It, it just really, I mean, same kind of wrote itself, but this was towards the end of the murder flow. So also kind of like, the climax of the book. So I'll be honest. Anyway, it, I mean, the book has lots of engagements, but this one was unique in that we, the human beings inside the aircraft did not escape unscathed. We were getting ready to engage the Taliban that was firing in a tree line, but we had to define where they were and we were developing that situation. And I could tell we were almost ready to develop it. So we were on what would be our outbound leg and on turning in, in, inward, inbound to engage. But it was kind of taking a second. So I slowed down a little bit, hoping we could get it cleared in on this next one. Otherwise, I'd have to do a whole lap um, and come back around again. And they did. They cleared us in. So I, well, okay, so I pulled it. I was about 60 knots and about 300 feet. And, and I banked it around and I was about ready to roll in and in the middle of that bank, you just like, oh God, I knew her and you start screaming and I, it is definitely a moment that it happens and, and there's no question what happens. It says I'm shot, you know, I hit her shot and it's a scream, you know, and, but I don't know if you noticed in the video, cause a lot of times that's what takes everybody's, everybody's attention is that scream. But in the video, there's also a thing in the background that goes, get it. RPM low, you know, which was more important than him screaming because motor RPM is what makes you in the air when you're in a helicopter. And when it's low, you transform a helicopter into a rock. And that's what was happening, right? So what happened is they shot out one of my engines at the same time they shot. And also when I was in the middle of the bank, I, this is happening, I went to go out of the bank and uh, like a drill. So at the time I didn't know why, but so this is all what I'm explaining to you happening now. That's it. So the engine's out. I got to, I'll have to adjust something immediately to make sure that we don't counterintuitively with the control in your left hand is called a collective. And that's what makes the helicopter go up and down. We're falling because we're losing the rotor. So we're falling down, but to get the rotor back, I need to increase the induced flow of air through the rotor system, which means I need to slam the collective down. So. You want to go up, that's what you want to do. But if you want the rotor to speed up, you need to see right? Or uh, basically 300, now 200, 150, it's happening with that. So, so I slam that down at the same time. I know that my cyclic, the control on my right hand, which makes the helicopter the right and left pitch forward backwards is jammed up. I have to break out of those controls. There's a backup control system on the Apache made by wire. It's a lot sloppier, but get to that backup control system, you have to break mechanical linkage, support it actively. There's no button or anything. It's a physical breakthrough. So I have to slam that over at the same time. Then meanwhile, you know, pop out screen. And there's all this stuff happening at the same time. So I slam the click down, I slam the cyclic right. But I remember thinking, and I don't know how I think this because it's a couple seconds, right? But I, they're, they're advertised that, that, that breaking will Going into the backup control system, there's a one second easing arc. I mean, nothing will take effect in the controls for one second after your linkage. I don't know if I knew why that was up until this point. Maybe I did, maybe I didn't. We were thinking as it was in there that I hope it works as advertised. Now I know why it's there because I am going to have to break in the direction we're already banking. So if it takes immediate effect, we will end up landing, which is not a way you land. Right? And so, I remember thinking, please work sabotage Boeing. <laughs> and so I snap it over and it did because I'm here. And then we brought it back and, and we're still falling because we have an engine that's out. So we're, our lift is not back it. So I try to gain some airspeed, make us a little more efficient. And then we start climbing up. Now I have to start working with that. 
Are you shocked? Are you bleeding from what's happened? Turned out why the heck the cyclic was jailed because his leg, his, his femur was it exploded. His leg got popped up and was around the sun. Basically, so well, that you can imagine what happens. Unkind was the Didn't know that at the time. So then, you know, we had a 30 minute flight back to Christian, which if you watch the video, you saw a lot of troubleshooting, was a lot of pain. Keep this thing out, let's coordinate an emergency here. I'll wait about a case of needs in there. I see a little bit of the city's there in the desert and miles low and that kind of thing. Let's get rid of extra weight. Let's punch in wing stores. There are all these different kind of things. And my wingman was being amazing. He's leaning forward. He's all given. They made bits of information because he knows that I'm up there being the a-holes and elbows trying to do, you know, whatever. It was really cool. It was really, I mean, the incident was, but the team work was cool. And the fact that like what I, what happened, you know, I did that, those movements, boom, like that. And we're flying and I had communicated immediately. I said, Hey guys, my front seat shot. Made a lot. It was all I told you. And the translation for that was, uh, and be all I can be, help me out as much as you can. You know, that's right. That's really, and that's what they did. They started communicating the ground days, they communicated for the bastion, they communicated the other wing into the air. They fell in on my six and made sure they told me if my engine's on fire, any of this other stuff. You know? And, uh, you know, it, it was just, it was a testament to training, it was a testament to the guys that flew it. It was a testament to the fact that together, you know, we made that happen. It, he made it, you know, the you know, the thirty minute flight. We got the first aid within Artemis. We put the pressure where I needed to put the pressure. We isolated, but it was all one wound. There's no exit. All that kind of stuff. You know, I said some stupid things like, you know, put your pressure on blood <laughs> instead of put your pressure on the wound. You know, you could see those and it, 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 listen to those people thing. But for the most part, I was pretty calm. I didn't really get elevated, and that was a testament to the chair you know, That was that was I was prepared. I had chair flown. I mean, I'd had my engine shot before, so that was a real thing. And then I'd had my, I'd had to break into backup controls and, and now range a couple of times already before that. So I'd already had real experiences in those two areas. And I had chair flown, getting wounded, me getting wounded, and old pilot getting wounded. I, the interesting thing was I never chair flew just him getting injured. It was either both of us, me, but never just him. And maybe that's a, maybe that's a, was there a, Actually, thing of my own, and I didn't want to be like the you know. And you could probably if I this is you don't want to be the one that's helping somebody, yeah. there, right? Then and, and uh, when, we, when I pulled him, I helped pull him out of the cockpit, and his leg came out right in front. Of him. You saw we started joking with each other, trying to keep our minds off of what was going on in that flight, trying to keep it light. They pulled him out. His wounds. I don't know if it actually paused in front of me, but my memory, my memory paused in his right in front of me. And there's just this huge hole and muscles hanging out of it and blood, you know, all that. And I'm looking, he sees me looking at it. And this was an attempt on one of them. And we um, got a little just for this part, missing over the video. He was trying to put my mind at ease as a little joke, but it was like punching me right in the face. You got me shot, right? <laughs> you know, and he's great. He was that guy. He was a guy that would do that, right? I mean, like he called his wife that night and said, I get to come home with her. She's like, why? He's like, well, I broke my leg. And she's like, well, bro, how do you break your leg? She's like, he's like, a bullet hair. <laughs> <laughs> he was probably trying to avoid, avoid telling her that he got shot, you know, all, all together. But, you know, when she keeps crying, you got to come. He, no, that, he, he was setting that up. He was, he's a comment. He was just that guy, right? He was just. He was always cracking the jokes. Yeah. And so it was more, it was to set my mind at ease the way he said it, but man, did it hit, right? You know, because, and it's along the same vein of, I didn't ever cheer fly just him. Uh, that we were, either both of us, were it as a team, or me, I'll take it, but it was never just him, you know? And so, you know, sometimes we want to do our cheer flying and we like, make sure that we're doing all of our bases. Because that's probably one thing that, that, I was from that deployment and I did have to deal with a little bit. You know, I did have to come in terms of that. There's always what it could have shoot us. There's always if I would have only kept it up speed or if I would have done this, or, you know, but, and those are true. 
you know, but even all the ones that had, that, that ended up really well, you can want a commissioner in those things. There's always things you can. Yeah, you know, and I think if I recall correctly in the video, you even said something like, hey, man, you're still here. If you feel the pain, the pain is good because the pain is telling you that everything's still working the way it's supposed to. You're supposed to feel pain. You got a bullet in your leg, right? And, and I knew that, that was true. You just made that up. <laughs> hey, you know, it sounded great. You know, and I bought it. So, and I'm pretty sure if I was sitting there with a bullet in my leg, I'd probably be like, yeah, you know what? Hey, he's probably right. So, you know, it worked. Yeah. It served its purpose. But then you also said, you know, it could have been worse too. And, you know, you're probably thinking to yourself, all right, yeah, I got shot in my leg. My, my legs got blood coming out and, you know, yeah. everything's screwed up there. But yeah, I mean, he could have got shot in the head. Like that could have been way worse. And that would have been, <laughs> been, I think that is what you said. Yeah. And it was a terrible, that would have been a lot <laughs> It is. Yeah. Don't be, don't go being a doctor or anything like that. Cause yeah. you'd probably suck at it. Yeah. I was <laughs> just trying with you a little bit. Yeah. I did say that. It is true. I mean, it, it, the situation could have been worse and it could have been worse for you too, because you know, you were flying there with him and you know, if the worst happened to him, that probably would have taken an even bigger toll on you, you know, mentally and everything like that, you probably wouldn't, wouldn't yeah. deal with that quite as well as, you know, an injury like this, but yeah, did love hearing some of the jokes between the two of you throughout that whole situation. Cause that meant that you had a minute to kind of collect your thoughts and yeah. kind of figure out what was going on. I, I think you even said something about, you know, if you wanted a purple heart, you could just throw in a rack at him or something. Like that. Yeah, that was terrible. I'm telling you, the funniest one I thought was like, you know, I was like, hey, 12 minutes down, just like that. He's like, I think it's going a lot faster for you, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which, which is, I, I have no doubt that's absolutely true. Well, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, as soon as he said it, I'm like, wow, I'm, I'm the jackass for saying this. You're also... Right. Yeah, you know, you're just trying to like get his mind off of the scenario, you know, trying to like, and at, not just his mind, my mind off the scenario too, you know, and I was get, I started giving him tests to do too, that would just, you know, keep him, you know, his, right. his, his legs blowing up, you know, so like, that's obvious. Let's get away from the elephant in the room. It's really hard to do because it's screaming the whole time, but, but yeah, and he did a great job at composing himself. I mean, he was the screens were from TX initially, and he brought himself back to the, you know, contributing member of that flight, you know. Correct. Yeah. And at first it was, I was like, oh my God, I can almost barely even understand what's going on here because it, like the screams were just that intense. It was so loud. But yeah. once when, you know, to your credit, you were able to get him to calm down, you know, you talked him down from the, all of that and you helped him understand that things were going to be okay. He's, he, as long as he kept pressure on the wound and he, uh, you know, he kept communicating, he didn't, you know, black out or anything like that. He was going to be, he's mo more likely than not, he was going to be fine. And mm -hmm. you helped him with that. And so, you know, not only were you able to fly this, this helicopter that was almost to the point of being unflyable, you know, you, you lost an engine, you know, the, like a lot of other stuff was going wrong with it. Um, you also kept him alive. And so that, that's like multitasking at its finest. Like, I don't think it gets any better than that at this point. Right. So, you know, I think you, you had a, a pretty incredible day that day, you know, you were awarded the distinguished flying cross for those actions. And I think it was definitely well-deserved for all of that, but I can only imagine, you know, being there, sitting there in, in the cockpit with all of that going on and trying not to crash all on top of everything else that was going on. That was pretty incredible. I know your book is out and I know there are probably people who are listening to this who want to find out more because I know we only touched on a little bit of some of the, the lessons and all that kind of stuff that are covered in the book. I don't want to give away everything because I want people to go out and buy the book. So oh, where can people go? To, yeah, <laughs> exactly. That was where one can people go to get 23? <laughs> That's, that's the, the whole thing, right? We want people to go get a copy of the book and yeah, I do. have something sure. that they can learn from themselves. So where can they go to get a copy of it? So there's good places. You can go to Amazon, of course, and it's cleared hot, you know, and then it has the very lengthy shit subtitle, but if you just do cleared hot, Ryan Slater, even just cleared hot, you should find it. And then there's cleared info is my webpage and you can order it through there too. 
Um, so either way, you can get it. Then it's in the hard copy and you're back. I am, well, at the time we're recording this, I'm currently doing the audio. Hopefully by the time this comes out, there'll be an ad in the book as well. But let me tell you, that's good. Yeah, people that can do that. Oh, like, I'm I, outside my comfort zone doing it, but we'll, we'll get it. Yeah. Well, you said earlier in this episode that you had no aspirations of being an author and neither did I when I wrote my book. As a matter of fact, if I, I think if I told any of my English teachers in high school that I wrote a book, they would probably drop yeah. dead with a heart attack or something, something right? Like I, yeah. I, I, had, I was not on a fast track to becoming an author, but I was even on a slower track to becoming an audiobook narrator. And when I did that myself, that was quite the project. No. So I, I can definitely, <laughs> definitely empathize with the process you are going through right now. So, you know, take your time. It, it's excruciating. It, it <laughs> is excruciating. I was just going to say that. And yeah, you know, but once when it comes out, it feels good. It's you know? probably true with you and you did yours too. For me, it's kind of hard too, because some of this stuff I haven't been able to read without getting choked up because it's real, you know, it's real. Yeah. And, you know, it, I think get choked up a little bit's okay, but, but, you know, if you have to pause too much, you know, so it, it has to be difficult that way, but it's also difficult, you know, just reading and not sell up. But, uh, but yeah, we'll get through it. We'll figure it out. And we'll get done. Yeah, for sure. So go to Amazon or go to clearedhot.info for a copy of the book. Definitely get a copy, support Brian and uh, everything that he's got going on with that. Brian, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you today. You know, I love having you on and love ha to have you back on again in the future, you know, to go a little bit deeper into some of this no likewise and there's lots of other places we could go so i'd follow it to the episode here. Mm -hmm. excellent all right thanks again <laughs> thanks for listening to the drive on podcast if you want to support the show please check out scott's book surviving sun on amazon all of the sales from that book go directly back into this podcast and work to help veterans in need. You can also follow the Drive On Podcast on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, and wherever you listen to podcasts.